Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you all this evening to the Indian Council of World Affairs. His Excellency, Mr. Boyar Osmani, Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Republic of North Macedonia, and Chairman in Office of the OSCE, will shortly deliver the 44th Supra House Lecture on the theme, Policy of North Macedonia and Presidency of OSCE. The order of the program is as follows. The interaction will begin with opening remarks by Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh, Director General ICWA, who will also be chairing today's proceedings. Thereafter, Minister Osmani will deliver the lecture. This will be followed by a Q&A session moderated by the chair. May I now request Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh, DJ ICWA, to deliver her opening remarks. Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to welcome His Excellency Bujra Osmani, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of North Macedonia, and currently the co-chairman in office of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, to the Indian Council of World Affairs. This is his first visit to India, and we look forward to his lecture today. I would also like to um, uh, welcome Ambassador Slobodan Uzanov, Ambassador of the Republic of North uh, Macedonia to India, members of the diplomatic community, my former colleagues from the Ministry of External Affairs, including Ambassador Kumar, uh, academicians, media, and the student community. His Excellency Bujar Osmani has been the Minister of Foreign Affairs since 2020. However, he has had held several important positions and has a varied experience in different fields. A practicing doctor by profession, he was appointed as the Minister of Health of North Macedonia in 2008, a position which he held for four years till 2011. During the COVID crisis, he was called upon to be a standing member of his government's crisis headquarters to deal with the pandemic. He has been the Deputy Prime Minister and the Chief Negotiator with the European Union when the key decision to start the process of North Macedonia's accession with the European Union was taken. Therefore, Excellency, for you, it would be personally satisfying that North Macedonia started its EU accession talks in July 2022. We hope that your country becomes an EU member at the earliest, which will definitely complement India-EU partnership. Earlier this year, North Macedonia assumed the rot rotating presidency of OSCE with Foreign Minister Osmani as chairperson in office. As a forum of 57 countries of the Euro-Atlantic region, its membership includes the United States, Canada, European nations, Russia, and Central Asian countries. OSCE seeks to bring comprehensive and cooperative security to this vast region extending from Vancouver to Vladivostok, as it is described. Excellency, your chairman comes at a very challenging time when several global and regional crises are occurring simultaneously. The ongoing Ukraine conflict in Europe has implications not only for European security, but its effects are rever reverberating across the globe as it has caused supply chain disruptions and concerns regarding flu food, fuel, and fertilizer security in all regions of the world, particularly in the global south. Prime Minister Modi has clearly articulated that this is not an era of war. India has called for a ceasefire and supports diplomacy and dialogue to end the conflict. We look forward to hearing with interest the activities of the OSCE in promoting peace and stability. North Macedonia joined NATO in 2020, the last entrant into NATO before the U Ukraine conflict. Since then, expansion of NATO has been undertaken, with Finland joining it recently and Sweden set to join. OSCE engages with NATO. This relationship has played a role in the security architecture of post-Cold War Europe, and both OSCE and NATO have complemented each other's efforts including in the Western Balkans, and North Macedonia is located in the Balkans. Therefore, all these developments would be impacting it. We also noticed that North Macedonia looks at sub-regional initiatives like the Open Balkan. India has historic relations with Balkan countries since the time of Yugoslavia. These ties of trust 
provide us a foundation of development of relations between India and Balkans, especially with the Western Balkans. After North Macedonia declared its independence from former Yugoslavia in January 1992, India was one of the 40 co-sponsors of the resolution in the UN General Assembly for its admission to the United Nations in the month of April 1993. India and North Macedonia have warm and friendly relations based on historical ties and shared values of democracy. Mother Teresa was born in Northern Macedonia, a unique link between our two countries. Over the years, we have witnessed a growing interest in North Macedonia for Indian culture and philosophy, yoga, movies, etc. Our economic engagement can be enhanced from current levels. India is a large and the world's fastest growing major economy. There could be several opportunities for our companies to work together in areas like IT, agriculture, food processing, pharmaceutical, and biotech, among many others. Hopefully, we can expand our cooperation, and your visit will be contributing to the building of our relationship. With these words, I once again welcome Minister Osmani and thank him for agreeing to deliver the 44th Sapru House Lecture on Policy of North Macedonia and Presidency of OSCE. May I now invite Mr. Osmani to deliver his lecture. Good afternoon. Thank you, dear Ambassador, for your kind words of introduction. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to address you today in New Delhi on the occasion of my official visit to India, the largest democracy in the world, an example for democratic progress and prosperity. Let me at the beginning congratulate you on your technological masterpiece, landing on the South Pole of the Moon. This achievement has brought India, but also the humankind, to the height of its achievements. I had a busy day today with numerous productive meetings discussing core issues of common interest and of our bilateral relations. I am grateful and impressed by the hospitality extended to me by my counterpart, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jai Shankar, and I'm confident that together, using our different strength but common interest, we can contribute to the better being of our own people and the world we live in. Although geographically far apart, our two countries are closely bound by the legacy of one incredibly strong woman, Mother Teresa, an ethnic Albanian from North Macedonia who pursued her noble mission here in India, serving those in need with love and humility. She is a Nobel Prize winner and a world symbol of mercy and humanity. Tomorrow I'm heading to Calcutta to visit her memorial house and resting place to pay tribute to her life and mission. And I'd like to use the occasion to expressly honor all the many strong, humane, caring women out there in India, in North Macedonia, in the world. Respect we also award to the Roma population in North Macedonia. In the last census from 2021, around 60,000 citizens or 2.5% of the population declared themselves as Romas. They are proud of their roots and origin from India. And my country is proud to be the first in the world with an entirely Roma municipality, with a Roma mayor, and with children attending schools in the Roma language. But I wish there were only good news to tell. Alas, my visit to India comes at a challenging moment for our global security architecture. And both our two countries have a significant role to play here, leading two important international platforms. North Macedonia, as it was mentioned, is chairing the OSCE, and India is presiding the G20. I truly believe that we must give our all to ensure the functioning 
and positive contribution of these platforms for the well-being of the people and for a bit more security in a very insecure world. The OSCE is the world's largest regional security organization. North Macedonia assumed the chairpersonship in 2023 in the moment of the probably most severe European security and geopolitical crisis since World War II. The war of aggression of Russia against Ukraine is breaching all international principles and commitments, whether enshrined in OSCE documents or the United Nations. And the price is being paid by the people. People in Ukraine are dying, losing loved ones. People are made homeless, forced out of their country, living as refugees, adding to the already highest number of displaced persons ever with all the social and economic spillover effects that come with it. And therefore, the motto of our chairpersonship with the OSCE is it's about people. But the war in Ukraine doesn't concern the people of Ukraine alone. It should be and it is of concern to all of us. It threatens world peace, and which is why I'm not tiring to seek to mend this conflict. Only yesterday, I had a phone conversation with Russia's Foreign Minister Lavrov. I'm not saying it was an easy conversation, and I'm not saying we resolved all or any issues, but dialogue between the unlock Un unlike-minded lies at the heart of what OSCE stands and exists for. I closely followed the recent BRICS summit in South Africa, and I'm of course aware of the leading role India plays within BRICS. And I'm asking you to use your own means and instruments to assist in ending this war and in bringing Russia back into the family of law and rules abiding nations. We can't go back to trying to snatch territory from other countries, if and as we please. I know that India upholds the principles of territorial sovereignty and inviolability as, as do we. I count on your support to help end this war and threat to our global security, our people, the future of the youths. The OSCE pays great attention to youth and their future from climate crisis and food security. Certainly core issues of interest here in India where we define security in a comprehensive way, comprehensive and multilateral. As staunch supporter and promoter of effective multilateralism, North Macedonia is firmly attached to the values and principles enshrined in the UN Charter. We care about the security of all not ending at the borders of Europe, and in actual geopolitical momentum, the role and the relevance of the UN remains of primordial importance. Maintaining something sometimes includes the need to change something. This might include a number of reforms in the UN system. And I'm offering India our partnership to think through and promote joint reform proposals. Although I'm aware that the current situation is not exactly conducive to any substantial move forward, we should remain engaged in exploring all possibilities to further reinforce the UN and make it more apt to address the global problems, starting from peace and security to climate changes, SDGs, and human rights. While India is an enormously large country, North Macedonia is small, and needs alliances, including in the defense field. This March, North Macedonia marked its third anniversary as a NATO member. During this period, we proved to be a credible and reliable ally, dedicated to promoting regional stability and maintaining our collective peace and security. It deserves underlining that NATO is a defense pact and has never and will never use aggressions against anyone. The NATO summit in Vilnius this year was held at a critical moment for transatlantic security. NATO leaders took decisions to adapt the alliance for the future, 
allies agreed NATO's most detailed and robust defense plan since the Cold War, strengthened their commitment to defense investment, agreed to bring Ukraine closer to NATO, and deepen partnership around the world. When faced with Russia's illegal war of aggression against Ukraine, NATO responded with unity and determination, providing unprecedented support to Ukraine and strengthening its own deterrence and defense. This also includes the new geography of the alliance with Finland's accession, doubling NATO's land border with Russia and soon with Sweden joining as well. North Macedonia is grateful that it can count on allied support should its, its territorial integrity and sovereignty ever be threatened. As a country situated in the Western Balkans, we had our share of blood and tears, fought hard to preserve, preserve or regain stability and peace. A peace that we all know is always fragile and can never be taken for granted anywhere. Peace between people requires hard, daily, active work. North Macedonia is focused on preserving the peace and stability in the Western Balkans. This was and remains one of the country's top foreign policy priorities. My country and myself are hence playing an active role, for example, in the process of normalization between Serbia and Kosovo. A pivotal meeting between the two sides was held on our territory in Ohrid on 18th of March, and a comprehensive agreement was reached. As our own Ohrid Peace Agreement from 2001 has shown and continues to show, the bulk of work now lies in its implementation. Finding agreements is hard, sticking to them and bringing them to life to the benefit of the people is harder and requires more work still. North Macedonia will continue to engage in the elaboration and the implementation of peace initiatives. In fact, within the framework of my OSCE chairmanship, I will be launching a center for peace and mediation in Ohrid. Why not we could name it Mother Teresa, which squares the circle back to the earlier part of my speech. I count on you to be part of that initiative and the woman we are jointly proud of. Let me conclude my statement with expressing sincere gratitude to Ambassador Singh, Director General of the Indian Council of World Affairs for hosting me today and for your presence in such a great number. And I'm open to questions and comments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Bourgeois Rasmani, for a very detailed talk. Mm -hmm. And the, that detailed talk would, I'm sure, lead to a number of questions. Minister has kindly agreed to take questions, so I will do the following. I will take three questions at a time, and then the minister will respond to those questions, and we look at the second set. So the floor is open to the question. Please, questions. Please identify yourself and ask the question. OK, there's a hand there. Uh, Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for that very comprehensive talk. I have a question. You touched upon Ukraine. So the varying degree of responses of the EU member states to the crisis uh, uh, showcases a diversity in responses. So what are your thoughts on European integration and evolving security architecture in Europe in general? Other questions? A hand is there. You have the floor. Thank you so much, sir, for your presentation. Uh, my question stems from what my colleague just spoke about. Introduce yourself. Yeah. I'm Dr. Stuti Banerjee from the Indian Council of World Affairs. So you spoke about the Ukrainian crisis. I wanted to know what are your views with respect to the EU policies uh, towards the Western Balkans, which includes you, and how do you think that will help in resolving this crisis? Thank you. A hand goes up there. Hello. Thank you, Excellency, for your comprehensive presentation. Myself, Dr. Puneet Gaur, I am fellow at the Council. And my question is, what challenges do you see uh, for OSCE due to the disagreement uh, with uh, Russia and Belarus? Uh, especially there are reports 
which are saying that uh, both are against the OSC chairmanship uh, to Estonia in 2024. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Minister, yeah. may I? I th thank you so much for your questions. I think first and the second questions question were similar, so I can uh, answer them both uh, in one response. European Union is considered as the most successful project. Maybe I am too biased, but it's considered as or one of the most successful projects of our civilization. A union that has brought and maintained peace and stability for more than seven decades and has brought and provided unseen prosperity for the countries that have joined the European Union. And the enlargement politics policies of the European Union are considered as the most successful policies of the European Union. Therefore, North Macedonia, since day one of its independence, had two main strategic goals. One was joining NATO and entering the security umbrella of NATO. And as I've been saying today, our region being at the crossroad of between the East and the West, to us it was crucial to enter into the security umbrella that NATO provides. And we achieved this in 2020. And we have shown in the last three years to be credible and reliable partner. And passing the first, uh, first but the most important and the biggest challenge that NATO has faced since it was established, and that is the Russian aggression against Ukraine. The second strategic goal of North Macedonia was to join EU. And this is a common goal of all six Western Balkan countries. If you look at the map of Europe, you will see that the region of Western Balkans is not a remote area at the periphery of Europe. So sometimes we say enlargement is not the proper word to describe the integration of Western Balkans in the European Union. But it's rather completion. Because we are a region of six countries surrounded by, on all sides by EU member states. So geographically, polit geographically, we are part of EU. And there can be no alternative to Western Balkans joining the European Union one day. Politically, we are part of the of part of Europe and the European Union. Economically, 75 to 80 percent of our economies are linked and connected to the economy of the European Union. Historically, we have been and we are part of Europe and we belong to the European uh, Union. Unfortunately, as the European Union was enlarging, the dilemmas and hesitation among member states about the complexity of its operational work, of its decision making, of its functioning, had been growing. Therefore, this dilemma, these dilemmas, which became also a popular mood among EU member states, stalled the process. This has created a huge wave of frustration within the Western Balkans, but also among the EU member states. Frustrations that created vulnerability of our region. Vulnerability that was exploited by different external forces to introduce their influences in the Western Balkans by exploiting the weaknesses, the latent uh, conflicts, and aspirations of, uh, of the region. The Russian war of aggression in Ukraine raised the awareness that enlargement policy of the EU is primarily a security policy. That consolidating EU, filling the gaps, closing the gaps within the lines of EU is of paramount importance in order for EU to have a, a, a better geopolitical projection, but also to, have, to be in a better stance to protect its, 
to protect itself. And therefore, lately we are seeing uh, we are seeing a, a way more intensive debate within EU how to approach the Western Balkans and how to uh, accelerate the process of integration of the Western Balkans. Uh, North Macedonia started the journey of integration as the first country in the region 23 years ago, 22 years ago, back in 2001. We were in a group with Croatia and Slovenia. Everyone thought at that time that this will be the first group to join EU, Slovenia, Croatia, North Macedonia. Unfortunately, there are two structural problems with the enlargement. One is the decisions are being made by unanimity. When the decisions of enlargement are made by unanimity, that means that member states have leverage to introduce and front load bilateral issues to the process. This has hijacked the enlargement process of the EU, and therefore North Macedonia derailed from this first group with Croatia and Slovenia, and first we had to go through the long dispute over the name of the country with Greece that took us almost a generation uh, of people. Uh, but finally, in 2018, as you know, we reached the uh, so-called PRESPA agreement with Greece, and we changed the name of the country by adding the adjective north in order to make, uh, to make clear separation with the region Macedonia. In, uh, I, I hope I'm not uh, too extensive. No, you no, will, uh, we are all listening very carefully. In 2018, changing the name of the country was the most painful process for our nation. We had to go through a referendum and to pose a question to our people, are you willing to join NATO and EU with the new name? People trusted this promise of the European Union that accepting this compromise will open the doors of the country for the European Union. Unfortunately, after this was done, another neighbor front-loaded their own bilateral issues to the process and by that stalled our journey uh, of accession to the European uh, Union. However, North Macedonia never stopped aspiring and working to join the EU. In all the EU reports of the European Commission, is scoring best in meeting the so-called Copenhagen criteria, political, economic criteria, and criteria related to the translation of the transposition of the EU acquis into our domestic legislation. And finally, in 2022, last year, we break another deal with Bulgaria, and by that we open the accession uh, talks hopefully uh, hoping to accelerate this process now in this new geopolitical context with the awareness around us that enlargement policy is a security policy. Two days ago, we were in Bled, in Slovenia, for the Bled Strategic Forum, and we were all positively surprised when the president of the European Union uh, went to the stage and sa said on behalf of EU that by 2030, EU will be ready to uh, accept uh, candidate countries, which means Western Balkans, but probably also here Ukraine and Moldova, who are new candidates, uh, are eligible to joining the European Union. So to uh, sum up, uh, North Macedonia is the best case scenario in the region in meeting the criteria for membership. The geopolitical context was not right, the process to accelerate. I believe that now uh, all preconditions are there, and soon, in a few, few years' time, North Macedonia, besides being a full-fledged member of NATO, will become a full-fledged member of uh, the European Union, and thus have additional platform for cooperation uh, with India, beside the bilateral one that we have already established and we worked on today. Thank you so much. On uh, the second question was uh, related to the challenges of the OSCE. OSCE is the largest secu regional security organization in the world. It was established in 1975 as a platform to bring together then the two blocks, NATO and the Warsaw, uh, Warsaw Pact. Introduced 
its unique approach to security, its comprehensive approach to security. So it sees security not only through its conventional military dimension, but rather through its holistic approach, introducing eco uh, economic dimension to security, environmental, and particularly human dimension of security, human rights and, uh, and, uh, uh, and democracy. Uh, the relations within the OSCE had been deteriorating in the recent years. The trust was fading. However, the 24th of February, the day when Russia attacked Ukraine, completely destroyed the trust among the 57 participating states, undermined the very foundation on which this organization is based. And this foundation is made of the commitments and the principles of the Helsinki Final Act, the Helsinki uh, Decalogue. It was our destiny to be at the helm of the organization at the most challenging time for the OSCE since it was established. However, the organization showed resilience in, even in the most difficult times. We have 13 field operations in the conflict regions. We have six field operations in the Western Balkans. We have five field operations in Central Asia. We have offices in, uh, uh, we had been and have been active in South Caucasus, in uh, Moldova, and in other regions of, uh, of our OSCE, uh, OSCE area. And OSCE, beside this blocking attitude of some member states who introduced the zero-sum approach to its functioning, continue to deliver. We were vetoed. Uh, OSCE has, had been present in Kiev, in Ukraine, for so many years, mm -hmm. having two, branch, uh, two branches. One, the SMM, the uh, monitoring mission that was established back in 2014 when Crimea was annexed, and the OSCE office in Kiev. Russia blocked the extension of the mandates of the OSCE in Kiev. OSCE found way to bypass this blocking attitude and to return back to, to Kyiv. So we established a support project for Ukraine with more than 21 programmatic activities that are related to humanitarian demining, that are related to supporting people in need, that are related to supporting the democratic institutions of Ukraine. So this is just one example that the spirit of the OSCE cannot be killed that easily beside using all formal uh, means to block the operations of the, uh, of the organization. Currently, we are facing with three main structural challenges. For the first time, we don't know who will be a chair next year. As someone said, uh, the gentleman who posed the question that Estonia put its bid for chairmanship of 2024, but it has been uh, vetoed by, uh, by Russia. We have no approved budget since 2021, again, because of the Russian Federation. And the mandate of the Secretary General and the three directors of the autonomous institutions will expire by December 4th. And based on what we are facing today, uh, it's most probable that we will face challenges in filling the vacant uh, places after December. So OSCE is facing a situation to have lack of political leadership, uh, executive leadership, and a budget. These are the three pillars of any international uh, organization. But I am convinced that beside our zero-sum game approach, beside our differences, we all agree that OSCE is an instrumental organization for our, part of, for our part of the world. It's going to be even more instrumental and impo important once there is a just peace in Ukraine. OSCE will be the first organization to start implementing the provisions of any peaceful agreement that will be reached between Russia and Ukraine. If Russia is going to decide in the future 
to return back to international community by recommitting to the principles and commitments of the international rules-based order, certainly the OSCE will be the first platform to do, to do that. So we have to care about organization. We have to invest in this organization that introduced a unique approach to security and has been an important pillar of the current security architecture of the world. I know that it came to us uh, to face these challenges in the most difficult times, but we believe and we will remain resolved uh, that the organization should uh, continue, be functional, and uh, uh, operational to serve the people. Therefore, the motto of our chairpersonship is, it's about people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister, for your very uh, detailed and informative responses, because I think each or everybody in the audience would have appreciated the whole process of accession to the European Union and its importance, and also the whole functioning of OSCE. I think the audience would probably be very, very, very informed, and you would see some writings coming out, I can assure you, from ICWA on the subject of OSC. Uh, the floor is open to questions, and I have, I see, to, uh, I see a hand here, Ambassador Kumar is here, then we go to a hand there, and then to a hand there. I'll take another round, time permitting. Oh, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, you, of course, as you mentioned, you have a very difficult task as the President of Office of OSCE. I'm just wondering, uh, what kind of vision do you have as the Chair of the OSCE for what kind of settlement might actually take place in Ukraine? And of course, it's more complicated by the fact that the, the Russian Federation actually considers NATO to be a, a, a warring party in the Ukraine conflict. So I'm just wondering, I mean, uh, given these kind of challenges, how do you envisage, let's say, the components of peace settlement? And just one small comment. I assume that when you talk about India's role uh, in the Ukraine conflict, you're talking about a national diplomacy because the G20 actually is uh, in the third London summit of the G20. It was a declared policy of the member countries that's a primary, is a primary global organization for economic coordination. And uh, very advisedly, all political and other matters were kept out of it. So uh, in terms of the fallout of the Ukraine conflict on the other countries in Europe and elsewhere, I think G20 certainly has a role to play. But precisely in the conflict situation, uh, it is not really the mandate of G20. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. We have a hand here. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Mahesh Deva. I'm a research intern here. So we spoke about the challenges the war has posed, the Ukraine-Russia war. But I wanted to ask you, what are the opportunities that you see for India and North Macedonia? Because seeing the number of steel imports by North Macedonia from Russia and the oil imports has gone up in 2022 from the years before. I think this and that was a huge opportunity for Indian companies because given India is also one of the world's largest net steel exporter and given that it is our Prime Minister's vision and our country's vision to see large amount of defence exports from India, do you think there's any role North Macedonia can play in harbouring better trade and defence relations in the two countries? We have a question right here. Yeah, Excellency, the way President Putin is facing a very hostile environment in his own domestic front, uh, particularly as a position leader and Wagner chief has been now assassinated. And the way President Putin has uh, drawn so many grain silos in Ukraine and some African countries are having a lot of grain problem, wheat problem. And do you think this type of Putin is going to be a long term surviving because he is skipping from BRICS and G20. So it's a hostile environment in his situation. What's your assessment about his president? What is going to achieve with all this thing? I said the floor is yours. Yeah. <clears throat> Regarding the role of the OSCE, 
on uh, possible talks or uh, between Russia and Ukraine. You know, the OSCE is a platform for permanent dialogue. When all avenues close, OSCE remains open. OSCE has a unique toolbox for all f cycles of conflict. This is the reason why it has been established. It has accumulated skill and, uh, uh, and instruments to help countries in conflict and in war. So since day one, I've said that OSCE is here, use the toolkit of the OSCE for the sake of restoring peace and, uh, and, prevent, and preventing conflict as well. Uh, I cannot say at the moment whether the OSCE is the organization to be the main platform for dialogue between uh, Russia and Ukraine. It's up to Ukraine to decide when they should uh, uh, move to talking with Russia since uh, they are uh, subject to aggression and to occupation of territories. So peace in Ukraine has to be a just peace for Ukraine based on the international principles of the UN Charter and Helsinki final, uh, final Act. But beyond this decision, OSCE is there and will be there to provide its services its unique instrumentarium to, uh, to support the establishment of, uh, of peace. And I mentioned during my speech, BRICS and the role of India, and given the principal position of India in support of territorial integrity and sovereignty, uh, synergizing our positions certainly, I think, will resonate further to uh, send the right, uh, right message also to Russia. Regarding the India-North Macedonia potential, I think one of the main, one of the uh, substantial reasons why I'm here today is also to see what is the potential for economic cooperation between India and North Macedonia. We are geographically f uh, distant country, we are different in size, but there is a potential. Uh, North Macedonia and India have established diplomatic relations somewhere uh, I think seventh uh, of f February 1995, so almost 30 years. Relations which are based on trust, on mutual respect, and mutual support. In 2009 was an important milestone in our bilateral relations when North Macedonia opened an embassy in New Delhi, and certainly I used my visit today to encourage India to open its embassy in Skopje, and by this. I believe that the, it will serve for, as an additional boost to our uh, deepening and strengthening of our bilateral relations. North Macedonia, it is a small country, but geographically is positioned at the heart of the region of Western Balkans and Southeast Europe, and also at the heart of Europe as well. The main pan-European transport corridor crosses through Skopje, corridor 10, connecting Black Sea to Adriatic Sea, crosses from Burgas in Bulgaria through Sofia, Skopje, Tirana, Adrach, to Brindisi in Italy. Just a few weeks ago, we launched a quadrilateral initiative among uh, Italy, Bulgaria, Albania, and North Macedonia called Initiative 8 around this corridor. So it's, a, it's an important artery to bring east and west. Then corridor 10 that connects Central Europe with Thessaloniki port also crosses through uh, Skopje, putting North Macedonia at the crossroad of pan-European transport corridor. North Macedonia is part of the stabilization and association agreement with the European Union, which means accessing North Macedonia's market uh, translate into accessing European uh, single market. We have SEFTA agreement within the region, which also remove Trade, uh, trade barriers. I will tell you one, just one example. 60% of the 
of the overall trade volume between the United Kingdom and six Western Balkan countries fall to UK-North Macedonia trade relations. So UK has recognized North Macedonia as its main hub for investment and for trade. Germany as well. 5 billion euro trade exchange with Germany, out of which two-third export of North Macedonia's uh, goods to Germany, mainly car parts. So North Macedonia is becoming a heaven for uh, car, car uh, automobilistic industry, for agro-business, and for green, uh, green renewable, uh, renewable energy. And this access, I think, provides for Indian business community a huge opportunity. And this it was one of my uh, initiatives here with uh, my interlocutor, with my counterpart. So we organized a business forum between India and North Macedonia. But, but I launched another idea as well. I said, let's do Western Balkan plus India uh, platform. Uh, since we, North Macedonia is in great relation with all other fifth, uh, five Balkan countries. Recently, I have established a platform called B6 of Foreign Ministers of Western Balkans. You know, Western Balkans is not very much known for good neighborly relations in the past, at least. You know, the word balkanization comes from the Balkan in pejorative terms for fragmentation and, uh, and uh, miscommunication. Things are changing. Western Balkans is moving toward building a common regional market based on the principles of so-called Berlin process. But this is not our end game. Common regional market is just a, a transitory phase to prepare ourselves for the European uh, single market. And therefore, I initiated today that we establish Western Balkan India uh, meeting, first at foreign minister level, and then we can expand it to other areas and uh, uh, bring more India to the region, but also bring more region to, uh, to, to India. Uh, Corridor 8 will become of strategic importance given the uh, difficulties that we have now with the war in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, related to the third question was related to uh, if I if I understood well uh, related to the policies of President Putin and uh, and uh, and Russia. Certainly, neither North Macedonia, neither uh, OSCE or NATO decides who will uh, lead uh, Russia. It's uh, up to the people of Russia to decide. What we have initiated since the beginning of the war we, that we should reach out to the people in Russia. We should encourage peer-to-peer -peer communication from all over the world, doctors to doctors, journalists to journalists, students to students. Because I believe that also with this policy of aggression, Russia, Russian people are kept uh, hostage. So it's not for me to decide who, but it's important that we reach out and communicate with people in Russia, since in the end, it's about people. And therefore, this is the motto of our chairpersonship with the OSC. Yeah, we have 10 more minutes. So. The minister would take one more round of questions. So. Okay, I, let me start with here. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Langel from uh, uh, ICWA. Uh, my question is basically uh, regarding NATO, which you have touched upon elaborately. Uh, so can you give us your assessment of NATO's response to the Ukraine crisis? And uh, how does uh, North Macedonia look at the NATO expansion. There was a ha hand here oh, and a hand at the sir. back. I'm Shripati. My question is more to do with your previous exp uh, experience in handling the COVID crisis. What do you think are the key lessons that governments across the world should or have learned? And are they resilient enough Sorry, to... Sorry, can you repeat once again? Are what are the key lessons that governments across the world should have learned or have learned 
after uh, tackling the COVID crisis. COVID. And I'll take one last question there. Um, thank you for that uh, interesting presentation. So I'm representing the CEO Strata. It's a thing. It's a youth-based think tank with with a distinctively Indian taste. So um, furthering on this, so my question is that uh, recently uh, our Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited Greece, and uh, it was just to further further the strategic ties which are there. So it's been a while that any head of state has visited Greece. So uh, now that Greece is one of your neighbors, and then you also mentioned in one of the, uh, in, you mentioned it before that uh, about regarding the changing of the name of North Macedonia to be something you mentioned that's painful. But yet you have all, uh, yet the people of North Macedonia have cooperated, and they are trying to in, uh, integrate with the larger European con uh, community. So. How do you think that uh, North Macedonia could add up to this new Indian, in Indo-Greek uh, access which is in the making? It might be foresighted. So could you throw us a light on how uh, North Macedonia could contribute on this? So thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Well, NATO is a defensive organization. It's not offensive organization. And it, it's policies are based on defense and deterrence. It's a political organization that serves to defend its own member states using, based on the Article 5, which stipulates that attack of one country is attack of all NATO, uh, or the, the NATO alliance. So NATO is responsible to protect every inch of the ally. But NATO has never been, it is not, and it will never be a threat to any other country outside NATO. It's a defensive organization. Uh, we believe that in countries should have the right to decide on their own about their geopolitical orientation or belonging to any uh, alliance or, or, or bloc. Uh, and therefore, I don't see NATO expansion as coming from center to periphery, but rather a voluntary strategic decision of countries to be part of a defensive alliance that has proved itself since it has established in terms of principles, in terms of uh, policies, and in terms of efficiency uh, efficiency as well. As I said, it was our first and most important strategic goal. We think that NATO, more NATO in Western Balkans brings stability, brings predictability, but not only political predictability, but economic predictability. I'll tell you one example. On the day when North Macedonia became member of NATO, big company from outside North Macedonia signed the decision to invest in North Macedonia. They waited, they waited for North Macedonia to become member of NATO in order to sign their investment. Because NATO provides economic predictability, political predictability for the countries that join, uh, that join NATO. Uh, at the moment in our region, we are three NATO uh, countries that are contributor of stability. We had been consumer of stability up to the point of joining NATO. We now provide stability in our region. And we think that only uh, uh, enlargement of NATO in the Western Balkans would provide long-term stability in the, in the region. Regarding COVID, I had the experience of managing two pandemics in my, uh, in my life. I was Minister of Health when the H1N1 pandemic broke. So I, I chaired the national efforts of the country in dealing with the pandemic then. And I was chair of the, a national coordinator for the efforts of the municipalities to deal with the challenges brought by the COVID-19. So 
this experience of managing two pandemics have brought a lot of uh, key lessons, as you, as you mentioned. And the main lesson is that the world is a small village and we have the same vulnerabilities and challenges. And that only if we work together, we can mitigate the consequences of those, uh, uh, those challenges. Uh, so I think COVID-19, beside other practical co collateral uh, transformation that has brought, like digitalization as a new way of, uh, of uh, doing business in the, in the world, I think it had, it had brought this sense how close we are, how uh, united we are, how vulnerable we are as a civilization, and that we need to go beyond the political differences, geopolitical differences, and zero-sum uh, game approaches, but to work together so we face the challenges that the new, new era it will, uh, will bring. The third question was, uh, if you can remind me, I... On Greece. On Greece, yeah. Well, it's interesting because uh, we did discuss that initiative as well. If India and Greece have already established strategic partnership and we and Greece have signed agreement of strategic partnership a few years ago, does that mathematically means that we and India are strategic partners as well? So this brings a triangle of strategic uh, partners that could be put in use in practice. And I've discussed this uh, uh, option with uh, my counterpart in Greece, but today as well in, uh, in, uh, in New Delhi. Thank you so much, Terry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister, for, for, a, for your Sapro House lecture on the policy of North Macedonia and presidency of OSCE. It was a very comprehensive lecture, and I think everybody benefited from it. And thank you for answering all the questions that came from the floor. And I now pass over to the uh, control. Thank you all for joining. We have now come to the end of the discussion. Please join us for Haiti at the Fire. <laughs>